All right. So um, as Patrick mentioned, my name is Sarah Gartland. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Center for Pedagogy and Public Engagement Research, which is within the School of Education at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, I'm excited to be speaking with you today on behalf of both the Live IT Project and also Dr. Paul Flynn, who's the PI on the Live IT Project here at NUIG. Uh, the title of my talk here today is co-designing web accessibility solutions with people with cognitive disabilities and i'm going to begin by providing an overview of the live it project and then i will share what we've learned across the four partner institutions and dive more specifically into what we've learned within the irish context here at nuig I'll do my best if you have, there's a lot of information because this project has a lot of different directions that it's working in. If you have any questions that pop up as I'm speaking, feel free to raise your hand or add them in the chat. I'll do my best to keep an eye on those as I go. So the Live IT project is a one year EU funded pilot project that kicked off last May. And its overall goal is to improve web accessibility for people with cognitive disabilities by doing research with people with cognitive disabilities. So involving them in the research process, the design process all the way through. And we've accomplished a lot in 12 months, but there's still a lot left to do. So this presentation is going to be a bit about what we've learned and then what that means for future research, future work as educators, so on and so forth. Four partner institutions, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Arcola Research in the UK, NUI Galway here in Ireland, and the Catholic University of Portugal form the Live IT Project Consortium. And the four partner institutions were tasked with setting up co-design labs in their respective countries. And as shown on the map, our co-design labs, uh, which I'll describe in mo more detail momentarily, were established in Galway, Bristol, London, Miranda, Sintra, Lisbon, and Thessaloniki. The co-design labs ran face-to-face -face and virtual because this project uh, took place during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The Live IT project is comprised of many different research activities that feed into each other. We began with baseline research, which included a systematic review of literature on web accessibility for people with cognitive disabilities. This review has been published um, and I can also make it available to you at the end of the seminar. And a tools and platforms search combined uh, to help us establish the state of the art in web accessibility for people with cognitive disabilities. So a snapshot in time, it's uh, a field that's constantly changing. Uh, so almost as soon as this was done, it was outdated, but we needed somewhere to start to move into our co-design labs. And um, at the same time as these baseline research activities were taking place, all partners also conducted what we called life world analyses by engaging in interviews, focus groups, and observation sessions with people with cognitive disabilities in the specific country they're working in and then also within uh, theme specific contexts. The themes are listed in the center of this diagram here. In the UK, they explored emergencies. In Portugal, they explored life skills. In Ireland, we explored self-development and in Greece, they explored help and support. The baseline research and life world analysis aided in planning and implementing the co-design labs, which is a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today. And uh, these co-design labs relied heavily on what we refer to as scenarios. These scenarios will be described in more detail in just a couple of slides. During the co-design lab implementation, something called an open toolkit was developed through a series of hackathons. The fifth and final hackathon will begin next week, and I'll also be sharing information about that. And finally, we have an online makerspace and community that we hope will live on beyond this project and be a piece of sort of the sustainability of what has already been done. So as I noted, I'm gonna focus in on the scenarios. I'm gonna share some sort of general information about how these scenarios developed in each of the uh, themed co-design labs and then zoom in on what um, I did with our participants here in Ireland. 
Uh, there's a lot going on in this project and one hour is not enough time to talk about it all. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on the development and implementation of these scenarios. We define a scenario as a narrative description of the life cycle of a user need within the project. A scenario includes descriptions of problems that need solutions, platforms and tools that can deliver a solution, and potential ways of using the platforms and tools. We're working to, well, we've developed, and we're working to validate a set of scenarios under each of the co-design lab themes. And the validation efforts focused on more specifically defined experiments within each scenario. An experiment is a method for testing a specific hypothesis related to each scenario. So for example, a scenario might be reading, an experiment might be using the open dyslexic font to read scholarly articles. Providing structure to the scenario validation process is our scenarios theory of change, which generally speaking is that what we learned from the baseline research and uh, our life world analysis informed the scenarios and experiments that we in turn used in our co-design labs that will then lead to the co-design of web accessibility solutions. So to kind of help you wrap your mind around what this uh, experiments and scenarios idea looked like um, in Greece, the help and support lab implemented four initial scenarios. And I'm also gonna be using terms like initial, revised and new with respect to these scenarios. And I'll explain in more detail what those mean in a few slides. Um, so in Greece, uh, their scenarios revolved around finding and using contact information, finding pharmacies and related information, navigation, and communicating via email. So you can see in the diagram here, the implementation of these scenarios eventually led to the creation of three new scenarios and one revised scenario. Their lab participants uh, had a wide range of cognitive disabilities. They ran virtual and face-to-face -face, uh, sessions. In Portugal, the Life Skills Lab implemented three initial scenarios. Uh, these themes revolved around using text-to-speech, using translation tools and completing complex tasks, all related to this idea of life skills. Um, and listed underneath each of the three scenarios, you'll see the more specific experiments. So under text-to-speech, for example, one of the experiments was using text-to-speech to read email. And um, the participants in the Portugal lab also represent a large range of uh, cognitive disabilities. In the, uh, all of the co-design labs, um, carers and additional educators or facilitators were welcome into the labs to help really truly involve the people with cognitive disabilities in all of the different uh, co-design activities. In the UK, the Emergencies Lab implemented four initial scenarios uh, around finding help in an emergency, preparing for an emergency, knowing what to do in an emergency, and optimizing your phone for use during an emergency. Scenario implementation here resulted in multiple individualized scenarios and then uh, the creation of one new scenario. Additionally, what they learned is that this theme presented additional challenges due to the em emotional toll of being asked to imagine being in an emergency scenario, um, which that created some uh, interesting findings from this particular lab. And uh, the emergency lab also had the largest range um, of people with cognitive disabilities involved. And they also were on, tended to be on the more extreme end of uh, sort of the spectrum, so to speak, uh, so that a lot of them had um, difficulty with uh, not just text, but could not read, for example. Um, and it would be great to be able to dive into specifics from each of these labs. Um, I'm just kind of giving you the, the whole overview. 
And uh, now I'm going to use the NUIG lab to provide some more specifics around some of the definitions that I've brought up and also uh, share with you more specific information related to education. So I've quickly brought up a number of ideas such as revised and new scenarios. And I'm gonna slow down to explain this a bit more now as I discuss the Irish context in more detail. Here at NUIG, we explored the theme of self-development, which we saw relating to education and employment. Three initial scenarios were developed, uh, one around, well, two experiments around reading, two experiments around writing by dictation, and two experiments about, around writing by typing. I designed these scenarios by engaging with third level students here, here at NUIG in interviews and focus groups. And these students had dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, and autism. So that's not the full range uh, of disabilities represented uh, you know, through the uh, or reported through the disability support services. Um, but uh, roughly speaking, the numbers that we got kind of, they weren't fully representative, but fairly representative of the population here at NUIG. And uh, this is a good time for me to kind of take a step back and share some of the key themes around the life world analysis, because I believe that they're important uh, and will resonate with a number of you as educators. So four themes emerged from the qualitative analysis of the interview and focus group transcripts from the life world analysis. And they were digital joy, digital anxiety, self-advocacy, and social support. I've gathered a few quotes here to help illustrate these themes and how they informed both my scenario planning and um, also what they might mean for us as we're thinking about planning and providing um, educational experiences. So under digital joy, the quote I chose is, you know, I'm loving the online education thing. Absolutely loving that because it overcomes a lot of the dyspraxia stuff. Students were generally enthusiastic about, about the web-based tools available to them and also just the virtual shift due to COVID um, because they saw it uh, ease a lot of the challenges that they would face um, in their day-to-day -day and also their educational lives. However, as shown here uh, in this description of posting on social media, so this next quote is just a student talking about posting on Facebook. Uh, they experience digital anxiety as well that can have some fairly uh, large consequences when we think about their confidence in the classroom. So there's definitely an anxiety element to having bad grammar and spelling. Like sometimes I might sit there and think, I really shouldn't say that because I probably spelt something wrong. It drives up the anxiety levels. You just think, I don't need to be heard right now. And that quote really stuck with me. Um, and I think that that's something that uh, we as educators definitely need to think about in planning and implementing instruction is how, how we can make sure that all of our students' voices are being heard authentically. And uh, students with disabilities also struggle with confidence around reading and writing in their day-to-day -day lives and their academic work. So these two activities became a natural focus point for the scenarios in the self-development lab. Often joy and anxiety were seen simultaneously, as you can see here. So like I told you, I love technology. So I love to read about things, to access information and so on, but I need to be mindful because it's like too much information. So here, one of the students um, with autism was talking about the challenges she experienced with both loving to consume information and having difficulty sort of monitoring her own intake of information with so much being readily available in the digital world. And uh, I wanted to, this kind of inspired me to make sure that I was planning for lab sessions that will allow me to explore this uh, sort of overlap of joy and anxiety responsibly with the students. Other themes such as self-advocacy showed up. So um, here you have a female, this actually was a mature student, 
has a lot of experience advocating for herself over the course of her life, talking about this overlap of perception as a student with a disability and also perceptions of her as a woman. So I think that in being a woman and having to be persistent because of my condition, but being a woman, I feel it's different. If I say a different tone on it or a different color, you know what I meant. Um, so I'm working to make what we're learning in this code design lab available to educators so that these students' first voices are heard, sort of helping with that advocacy piece. And finally, the students discussed social support frequently as shown in this quote. So meeting other students with disabilities is a really big thing and understanding like common kind of, you know, difficulties. Therefore, I worked to make the co-design lab a sort of community in and of itself, and also to connect our participants with all aspects of the Live IT project, um, which has a community element to it as well. And inspired by the baseline research and the life world analysis, I designed the three initial scenarios that I had had up previously around the reading, writing by dictation, and writing by typing. During the co-design lab sessions, students worked through one or more of the scenarios, and participant feedback was used to revise the initial scenarios, create new scenarios, and also capture data related to the improvement of existing or creation of new web accessibility tools. So a lot going on there. We're working on uh, making these scenarios that others can use to sort of work with tools with people with cognitive disabilities, but also capture data on the tool use itself um, to either improve or create new web accessibility tools. When a given scenario was used in a lab session, I collected data using a cognitive interview protocol that referenced a tool use survey that students filled out prior to or during the lab session. So that was personal preference if they wanted to fill it out without someone watching them. Um, and then participants shared their screen and showed me how they used specific tools to accomplish each of the steps in each scenario. Uh, and when appropriate, I also kind of use this uh, positive, negative, and delta sort of approach. What do you like about it? What do you dislike about it? What do you wish you could change? One of my favorite questions to ask was, if you had a magic wand, what would you create or make or do? And that led to a lot of very interesting responses. And... Um, Yeah, so for example, uh, in these uh, sessions, a student might show me how they decided to use which tool to get through a reading of an academic article. And then based on the data that I collected, I would either make revisions to the existing scenarios for future use in the lab, or I would write a new scenario. Uh, 11 students participated in the self-development co-design lab. These students listed primary disabilities of ADHD, dyslexia, acquired brain injury, or epilepsy. All students also listed additional disabilities uh, or diagnoses such as dyscalculia, dis depression, and anxiety. Um, so a lot of uh, layered and complex things going on here. My lab sessions were 100% virtual and run on the Zoom platform. Initial lab sessions were always done one-on-one, -on -one, and then if students agreed to it, they participated in subsequent focus group lab sessions of three to four students, and some students preferred to stay with the one-on-one, -on -one, and so they continued their subsequent lab sessions one-on-one. -on -one. The use of the initial three scenarios yielded two new and two revised scenarios as shown here. Um, so we went from just the reading and writing to then expanding out to um, different experiments around the use of transcription tools some new ideas around reading and writing. So for example, with writing, um, I had not planned to do any experiments around using a read aloud feature to correct your own work in your writing process. 
but that was something that was naturally, it came up during the course of a number of different um, lab sessions. So I wrote it in as a new scenario. And that really highlighted to me the importance of, um, as someone who's working both as an educator and a researcher who is neurotypical or does not have a cognitive disability, um, I'm not going to be able to anticipate or predict everything that these students might be doing, the very creative workarounds that they've come together, uh, put together for themselves. Um, and so to be tuned into listening to what are your students doing, how are they coping with different things can really help to either improve the way that you're writing your own assignments or, you know, plan for how to get them done differently. Um, and I think. Wait. Uh, Yeah, there we go. And we explored a variety of tools. And uh, I was really careful to only use paid tools that the students already had access to. So I coordinated heavily with the Disability Support Services at the beginning of this project to uh, make sure that one of the key concerns was, you know, this project may have had money to provide students with tools, but it was going to be very irresponsible of me to provide them with the tools for a few lab sessions, have them fall in love with the tool and then say, oh no, sorry, we, we can't continue to provide this to you. So uh, that points to an issue in and of itself in that, uh, you know, getting access to some of the best tools out there is something that requires uh, financial assistance. Uh, disability support services are great at the various universities, um, but not all students that actually took part in this project were registered with the disability support services because they may not have had um, a formal diagnosis yet. That was something that was still in progress. Uh, again, that's something that costs money, so on and so forth. Um, so just a reminder that there may also be students in the various classes that have a disability, but it's not formally recognized um, and they'll be just as deserving as any of, the, of any of these supports. Um, any of the tools that I recommended they give a try to, um, I made sure that they were all free or had a free uh, element to them. And scenario impl implementation didn't just produce these validated scenarios. So the different um, you know, sets of experiments that can be used by other researchers in the future. It also highlighted four key themes. Uh, the first being that PDFs are still a major challenge. Students showed me the difficulties they encountered with trying to use text-to-speech on articles with tables, uh, two-column formats, anything with bracketed statistics. Um, I listened, I watched as one student basically tried to use multiple, uh, it's, it was a problem they had already had prior to this lab session, but basically ran through trying to show me what it was like getting multiple different te uh, text-to-speech tools to try to read through a paragraph that had statistics in it. Uh, you know, a scholarly article that they had to get through for whatever course they were taking. And it was, it was very frustrating for myself to sit through. And I, I you know, it, I can't imagine someone having to do that repeatedly. Um, and there are implications here for developers and for educators. So for developers, let's fix the PDF issue. Um, so how, you know, how, that, that's a challenge that needs to be taken on. And for educators, you know, we might not be able to wave our magic wand and magically have all of these PDFs work perfectly with text to speech tools, but uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that that challenge still exists for our students. And the next two themes are highly related to this one. Uh, coping with text is still a major challenge. Um, students spend a lot of time cobbling together various workarounds to both consume and produce text. And education is still very heavily reliant on text consumption and text produ production to kind of demonstrate your proficiency. Um, again, related, taking, uh, oh, sorry. Should have had the text to speech is great, but sometimes isn't, should have had that third. Um, this isn't a new theme and neither are the three that I've already talked about. 
in fact, uh, reviewers keep complaining to me that I'm not contributing any new anything new with these three themes, the PDFs, the coping with text, and the text-to-speech bit here. Um, but my argument and my reason for sharing them today is that despite decades of technological advances, these themes are persisting. So uh, my, my feeling is that taking the step to involve people with cognitive disabilities, both in the development of tools and also the planning of courses is needed to really make progress. Because I think one of the limiting factors is people who are in positions of you know, relative power, the ones who are developing or the ones who are educating, tend to be those who are not operating with a cognitive disability. So that, that naturally creates blind spots. Um, the uh, bullet in there to take the time to learn the tools that actually has, uh, you know, there are facets of that that spoke to the student experience, but then also what they perceive to be their lecture experience. So, um, you know, time, <laughs> we never have enough time in education, uh, but taking the time to really learn the tools that you are planning to use well um, is, is key. So the students really appreciated when um, you know, they had tools that were presented to them that the person who was presenting them or the person who was asking them to use these tools really knew and understood the workings of the tools. And then uh, the fourth and final theme here, or fifth and final theme here, is that learning from tools and this idea of tools learning from us. So this was the most interesting theme for me. So uh, an example of this, uh, when discussing the pros and cons of Grammarly, that was one of the most commonly talked about tools. Uh, it's very widely available, it has a free version. There are paid versions available that a lot of the students who are uh, with the disability support services have access to. Uh, many participants explained that they really wanted the tool to teach them why certain corrections were being recommended. So like, they were telling the tool, I hear you, <laughs> I know it needs to be corrected, but I really want to know why. And, uh, you know, maybe it was just that this is the point in their educational career where they have the headspace to kind of really think about why is this something that, you know, my disability is uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, make, I'm wanting to phrase this correctly, but uh, you know, because of my disability, I'm consistently making this particular mistake. They want to wrap their mind around what the mistake is, what it is about the way that they approach or produce text that kind of consistently triggers this mistake, and then how can they create a plan for themselves to fix it? Like, they all very consistently communicated this desire to learn how do I get myself to a point where I'm not making this mistake anymore. And then additionally, they wanted the tool to learn their own style. So if they're writing in a particular style um, and the tool is consistently you know, flagging something for tone and they're consistently ignoring it, uh, is there a way that the tool could be taught to learn from them basically? Um, and so that may not necessarily be a super relevant uh, piece of information for educators that might, that second part might be more for the developers, um, but it's still a very interesting finding. And uh, that I'm now going to kind of all of a sudden jump uh, tracks here a little bit to now talk about a few of the other activities that are still left to go in the Live IT project, how you can connect with us and get involved, and then I will open it up for questions. So uh, there's a lot going on in this project. One of the other things is hackathons. We've had four hackathons so far focused on sort of these dual uh, goals. One is brainstorming web accessibility solutions. And the second is improving the Live IT Open Toolkit. A fifth and final hackathon will be taking place virtually beginning on uh, Friday the 20th of May. More details will be following shortly um, that I definitely will disseminate to all of my contacts, but please do contact me if you're interested in participating. And actually, I'll take a moment here to kind of break out of this, go to the chat, and my email is now in the chat. 
And uh, this next slide is about the Live IT Open Toolkit. I'm gonna to take a moment to drop that link in the chat. Oops, not that. Before I jump back. So here uh, we have a screen capture of the Live IT Open Toolkit, which has three major features to it. One of them is a catalog of stakeholders, which actually is organized by, you can search by country, you can search by group. So IT um, representative organizations, uh, developers, things like that. The um, middle part, the advisor tool is uh, a listing basically of all of the different tools that we have worked with throughout or across the four co-design labs. So not just here at NUI Galway, but also the three other labs in the UK, Greece and Portugal. Um, and the tools have been rated and used by people with cognitive disabilities in the co-design labs. Um, there are videos and how to's and things like that, and you can find lots of information on the various tools. And then also the online community and makerspace is linked through the third tab, which I have another link coming up for you here. There we go, sweep. And I'm gonna drop the projects website in the chat as well. Uh, through the project's website, you can find access to our newsletter, our social media sites, and also this circle.so um, site is our online makerspace and community, which is what we hope will extend beyond the life of this project, which unfortunately is wrapping up shortly. The end of May will be the end of our funded project, um, but the makerspace and online community will live on, continue to be hosted. And we envision that being a space where people can continue to come together around designing solutions for web accessibility. 